Hey, Dr. Bill Stinnard here. Welcome to God's Love for the Unlovable. We're going through the book of Hebrews. It's a very unique and for the most part poorly covered book uh, from most pulpits. Why? Well, <laughs> you're going to find out today. Sorry ahead of time. One of the biggest themes in the book and one that most of us would rather not uh, talk too much about is persecution and that it's inevitable for faithful Christians. And that's not the message I want to hear for sure. What do I do when I get smacked in the mouth as I follow Jesus, as I reach out to the lost and the beat up, the victims, uh, and persecutors too, by the way, the messy church? Well, we begin there, but then we drift. And if we drift too much unaware, we will not be faithful when we get challenged. We're going we're gonna to slip around. Uh, the blueprint that Hebrews points to is Jesus. He did all of those amazing good things for people and was still persecuted, horribly so. It seems that the author of Hebrews knew that persecution was coming to his listeners in particular. Well, we in North America just have been spared from a lot of persecution recently, but it's all around us. Did you know that according to Open Doors, 365 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith. One in seven Christians are persecuted worldwide. Almost 5,000 were killed for faith-related uh, reasons last year. Last year, almost 15,000 churches and Christian properties were attacked. American Christians, look, we just enjoy broad religious protections under the law. And the intensity of what Christians face here really does right now pale in comparison to the depths of persecution suffered by followers of Jesus in many other places around the world. But if Hebrews is right, it's coming. Well, welcome to God's love for the unlovable. So in the first show on Hebrews, I spoke about the church life cycle, and briefly, churches or individuals begin their walk with Jesus with great anticipation and expectation. We're so moved, we're so changed, that we're wildly other-oriented, we're sacrificial, we're willing to give up our preferences, you know, music and so forth, and even our comfort, our security, our well-being, if we can just tell others about Jesus because we want to share, you know, can I tell you what Jesus did for me? Uh, here's where he found me, and uh, right? And, and at that point, in incline, we tend to accept persecution. It's like a badge of honor, something that we share with Jesus, and for some reason, we expect. I mean, it hurts, don't get me wrong. We're not looking for it. That's foolish. It's uncomfortable, and we wish there was a plan B, but, you know, we somehow connect with the value of it, the importance of it, the Jesusness of it. If it means that somebody else will hear about Jesus, I mean, the option is for me to be quiet? I don't think so. It's worth something to somebody, right? And we see somehow that it's not a purposeless persecution. It's a risk or reward. My risk for the reward of others hearing about Jesus, that sounds about right in incline. See, I'm beginning to see things through the lens of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is making that happen. And this is not looking for persecution, right? That's something totally different. This is being made willing by the Holy Spirit in my inner being to die for others. Hebrews strongly says that we should expect persecution. We begin telling others that there is a singular God who is in charge, who's running things, even though it looks and feels chaotic, we don't understand it. And, it, and look, we're not going to submit to Rome as God or Washington as God or any religion as God because Jesus is God. Jesus is sovereign, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our careers are underneath Him. No, I can't explain why bad things happen to this person or that person. They happened during the time of Jesus too. But for some reason, I believe that God has got this and will explain it eventually uh, to everyone's satisfaction. Well, that's just crazy talk, right? The elites will just look down upon you and think you're an idiot. But for that alone, the people in authority are going to despise you and try to shut you up. The elites, they're going to, man, they can do it really well. They're going to degrade you. Uh, mock you, shame you. They'll call it blind faith, you know, like, like, come on, what's wrong with you, right? In places like ancient Rome, 
you likely won't last long if you keep sharing that stuff with people. You're going to be marked as a disruptor of state, and you're going to have a target on your back. Yeah? You will be persecuted. In the immediate context of Hebrews, this likely happened when the emperor Claudius, about 49, common era, gave an edict that expelled all of the Jews from Rome. And imagine, uh, if you're a Jew, and I'll, I'll say something more about that, a Christian Jew in particular, your family, your livelihood, your friends, your context, you're out, gone. We're told that the, it was the followers of Crestus, which many people believe is Christ. They were disruptive. And from the Roman point of view, they needed to be stopped. We can't be sure, but likely there were Christians who just wouldn't shut up about their new leader, a dead rabbi that Rome crucified, and is now risen from the dead and reigns on a throne higher than Caesar. So they argued that, therefore, he's the only one worthy of being worshipped and followed and bowed to, not Claudius. Well, you see the problem. Persecution is inevitable. Perhaps leaders were put in jail or tortured or crucified. But you get the idea, they learned pretty early on, that the message is threatening to the world. I mean, it's, it's also beautiful for victims, but it's threatening to the powers that be. We modern Christians in the United States have this unbiblical programming in our heads that if we're faithful enough, whatever that is and enough, then God's going to protect us. But, you know, the Old Testament is riddled with faithful people suffering, the same as the New. But listen to Psalm 102, and the author of Hebrews is going to refer to that in just a minute. Hold on. Here it is. It's a prayer of an afflicted man. And think afflicted faithful man because he's praying to God, right? When he is faint and pours out his lament before the Lord. Faithful, right? Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly, for my days vanish like smoke. My bones burn like glowing embers. Because of my loud groaning, I'm reduced to skin and bones. All day long, my enemies taunt me. Those who rail against me use my name as a curse. Whew. It's an old biblical story. A faithful person, a believer, who God loves, who is still suffering persecution. And it, you got to say God ordained for good, ultimately. Though at this moment, there's no way for him to see that. Right? Or me, I, could, I can't explain it to him. The author of Hebrews gives us Jesus as our example of how closely aligned persecution is with faithfulness and obedience. In the days of his flesh, when he was human, Jesus offered up prayers, this is Hebrews 5, and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, the Father. And he was heard because of his reverence. Boy, we like that. Let's memorize Hebrews 5.7. Right? Jesus prayed in the garden that the cup would pass, and he was heard, says the author of Hebrews, by his heavenly Father who loves him more than, than anything. But, verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Purposeful suffering, even for the Son of God. The answer that he got from his loving Father, who totally adores him, and it was this, press on. Uh, into the designed, necessary suffering, the death and resurrection. But, and, and if there is a formula in Hebrews, this is it. God ordained suffering, suffered faithfully, whatever that means, is followed by an even greater crown of glory, whatever that is, in the good of others, the salvation of others. That's the formula. That's suffering. It's, it has a purpose, a grand purpose, but it sucks. So, and this is our earthbound journey per Hebrews pre-heaven. We're not promised a peace and security here, not like what we imagine. We are promised persecution and a crown of glory, again, whatever that is, when we faithfully, whatever that means, follow God's voice, <laughs> whatever that means, right? Our job, we're charged to be faithful inspired and empowered by his spirit with the spirit's faith, his faith, not mine, in us for the sake of others. That's, that's the point, for the sake of others, for the well-being of others, for the salvation of others. And that's what Jesus did. Then, like in some ways Jesus did, we will receive honor and glory 
through the suffering, our faithfulness in that, in heaven, whatever that looks like. So back to the hearers of Hebrews. So now, right, uh, and this is my guess, five years or so since the expulsion from Rome, that's passed. Some of them are back in Rome. You've been smacked in the face. Your leadership has been removed, maybe tortured or killed. Maybe they're a little more hesitant, right? Your historic people, the Jews, are quietly gathering in their synagogue and trying not to be disruptive. They've learned uh, one of the ways to avoid persecution to some degree, uh, though not for long, history tells us, is they're not proselytizing. They're not preaching this to other people. They're just abiding by it themselves, right? Christians, you can't do that if you're a faithful Christian. You've got to go out and speak. So they do the religion of the tabernacle, the a speak of sin and guilt and sacrifices among themselves, it really does make sense to you if you're a Christian Jew, uh, because that's how you were raised. And it seems much safer, by the way, than trying to keep gathering with those disruptive Crestus followers, again, uh, who still have targets on their back. And truth told, you're a little less excited about Jesus. That talk got you into trouble before. And this new guy, Nero, seems like a hothead. So you've drifted to that reclined phase of church, well-meaning, no judgment, and you want more of your needs taken care of, specifically security and safety, and knowing that somebody has your back. You know, what about me? Again, no judgment. And you're asking the obvious question, wait a minute, Jesus, where were you when, when, when we needed you? Right? Sounds like the psalmist. We've been faithful. We said what you said. We risked it all, and then we were displaced destitute, poor, no home, no job, and we still have a target on our back. Where, where were you? I mean, were we wrong? Are you still there? Do you care? We have to feed our families, so we're going to have to join a union. We need to do that, and we're going to need to go and do an offering to their deities. We're going to need to bow before Nero, so now what? Maybe we need to just go back to, you know, the synagogue and offer God's sacrifices. <sighs> no judgment. I get it. Apparently, there was a lot of talk about avoiding persecution. Text-wise, there is no greater topic in Hebrews. I'll go through some of the many verses on suffering and persecution in Hebrews. This is one of the reasons I think that we don't preach through it more. Uh, it can be scary to Christians here, right? So a little heads up. Suffering is used six times, tempted three times, testing three times, persevering, enduring five times. Wow. Wow. And all of those relate to God-ordained, Jesus-managed persecutions, largely for the sake of others. And obedience, um, faithfulness, almost exclusively refer to how well we do. And sin is the word the author of Hebrews uses for unfaithfulness through persecution, primarily. All right, here's Hebrews 2. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone in bringing many sons to glory. You see the other orientation? It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. So Jesus is our template, the one who went before us, who we follow. God designed the path of suffering which led to glory and salvation for others and added unique glory and honor to Jesus. Not that he gained an innate glory, but he has now uh, the, given the moniker of the suffering Messiah who saved many, because that's what he did through his suffering. Uh, here's Hebrews 2.18. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted... He is able to help those who are being tempted, meaning since he went through suffering, he's there. He's able to help, when, help us when we go through suffering. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. So in the midst of suffering, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Well, yeah, here's all Hebrews. You need convincing? Jesus did it. And he helped others in the process. That's our heart. That's the DNA of God and the Holy Spirit in us that we access. So you, Christian, who have the same other-oriented spirit in you, are also called to suffer for the sake of others too. 
We think of suffering often as mine, individual, but in God's economy, our suffering is somehow positive for others who are being saved. It's not just that I'm going through suffering. My suffering is leading to salvation. Jesus empowered. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation and I said their hearts are always going astray. See, this is not following God into the, into the, into the persecution. And they have not known my ways. And the ways seems to be laced with persecution. So I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That's Hebrews 3, 7 to 11. So this is referring to the people of Israel who had been miraculously rescued from Egypt, who saw miracle after miracle done for them. And imagine, but then God says, okay, let's cross Jordan Let's take the land of Israel. Let's enter into the rest, my promised rest. By the way, this rest is not what you might think on the surface. So they sent spies and noted, (laughs) observed, that this was not a cakewalk. It wasn't like God removed everybody and they were just filling a vacuum. There were lots of powerful, scary people there who had some rights to the land. What kind of rest was this? I mean, this rest could get you killed. So it's... God's test, an opportunity to manifest your faithfulness, implied spirit sourced, his command, think, hey, trust me, you saw what I did to Egypt. Yeah, it's, it's going to be painful. It's going to cost some lives. I've got them too. But you are in my arms. And even in the midst of persecution, I've got you. I'll make all things good. I'm with you. I've got you. But they didn't. And they hardened their hearts. And the synonym is they disobeyed. They shrunk in fear, flight, fright, freeze. They didn't trust God's care. They lacked heaven-sourced faith, perseverance. All of that is the essence of sin for the author of Hebrews. So God disciplined them. It does not necessarily mean they're going to hell. It doesn't mean that. They lost covenant. It doesn't mean that. It means that God has a plan B with people who are going to exhibit real faith. They missed out on miracles and blessings of God. So who were they that heard and rebelled? This is Hebrews 3. Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, meaning unfaithful, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, meaning the promised land, if not those who disobeyed? Hebrews 3, 16 to 18. So for Hebrews, the unwillingness to go through suffering is the biggest sin. You know, we generally think of adultery and greed and theft and so forth. Those are sin too. But knowing, but for Hebrews, knowing that persecution is coming, this is worse. It is a lack of trust in God's goodness. Verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, meaning I don't want to do this, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin, meaning he was totally faithful. He obeyed, chapter 6, verse 12, persevered all for the sake of others. That's that other orientation. We do not want you to become lazy, and the lazy is not just, "Ah, I'm, I'm busy today, it's unfaithfulness to God's calling right now, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised this blessing of God for the sake of others. All right? It's the reward of glory and honor gained through obedience and suffering. Right? I'm sorry I'm, sh- I'm sharing this with you, but look, it's not me. It's, it's Hebrews. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted confiscation of your property. I mean, really? Because you knew that you yourself had better and lasting possessions. That takes heavenly faith, right? So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere, here it is again, so that when you have done the will of God, meaning follow me, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, 
He who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith, heaven-sourced faith, and if he shrinks back, if he does, I will not be pleased with him. But we're not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Hebrews 10, 32, 39. And don't think eternal salvation there. You get it, right? One more verse. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, meaning unfaithfulness, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, that current uh, continual theme, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Remember, fix your eyes on Jesus, how he did it, what he did. In your struggle against sin, meaning fear, unwillingness, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. Well, once again, the specific struggle against sin is being tempted to disobey, to fall away from your designated path of persecution, to not obey, to not be faithful. So what can you do? I mean, because let's face it, the normal human trigger is to run, to protect ourselves, to focus on our own security and well-being and, and of our family. Fight, flight, freeze, right? Well, here's what we do. We fix our eyes on Jesus, and we start now because persecution is coming. We consider him. We obsess over his life and death, and as we do that, the Spirit gives us that faith, obedience, perseverance, fruits of the Spirit, right? Gives us love for others. He, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21 gives us endurance. Well, have you heard the old joke, a man falls off a cliff and at the last second grabs hold to a single skinny branch sticking out from the vertical wall and it's breaking and he prays, God save me if you're there, rescue me. I will die if this breaks. And he hears a voice from the top of the, matter of fact, the heavens, child whom I love, I've got you, just let go. The man pauses, ruminates over what the voice said, and then cries out, Is there anyone else up there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, here's Hebrews 12. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, children. My child, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a child. Endure hardship as discipline. See, he, he makes them equivalent. Hardship and discipline. Persecution and discipline. God is treating you as children, uh, his children. For what child is not disciplined by his father if you're not disciplined? And everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Hebrews 12, 5 to 12. Look, he knows that our immediate tendency is going to go fight, flight, or freeze, right? It's just, he knows. And the goal is to focus on Jesus. So when the persecution comes, we can actually be used as part of the plan of salvation for others. The author of Hebrews is suggesting that the design path of persecution is a good thing. It's from the loving hand of a father. And it's painful. It's costly. It's uncomfortable. Bloody even, maybe. But in the end, righteousness is created. Remember, interesting word? At its core, it refers to other orientation. You're suffering for the sake of others, just like Jesus did. Right? Reasonably, it makes sense, and yet, who wants it? That's the nature of persecution under God. It's happening to you, but others are being rescued and saved. In the end, you get glory as a little c co-savior, little less. If God just lets you wander, what kind of father would that be? He's got a higher purpose for you. Hebrews 13, 12. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. See? Formula. Look, I know this is not popular Christianity, but it is the only one we've got. 
There is no other God up there. So why can we do this? Remember I quoted the faithful person being persecuted, Psalm 102. Hebrews quotes that, uh, the end of that psalm, Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Here it is. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They're going to perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, including your persecution. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. Right? And this is from the same psalm that I quoted earlier. Remember that the, the faithful sufferer, Jesus is so large, has such gravitas, that I need not reasonably worry about suffering in the long run. It's not just willy-nilly. It's not just without a purpose, not out of control, not random, but it's carefully designed and managed providentially to accomplish whatever God wants it to, to accomplish. It, it was designed for you, yeah, but also others through your faithfulness. All of the pains, all of the insecurities, chaos, it's like a blanket. And Jesus is going to roll it up and toss it in the closet like a movie set. It's not about finding why or getting justice at this point or some explanation, right? Okay, God, I'm willing, but tell me why and here are my guidelines before I'm in. Uh, you know, negotiate it with God. It's seeing a greater loving hand behind it, trusting God. Again, you can access that through the Holy Spirit. It's one of the fruit. Who will also crown me, you, with honor and joy and use you to save others. Yeah? Well, next time we're going to dig into the next section, 2, 5, and following. I'd love to get your feedback on all of this. Just letting you know, I also have a couple of books that should be published sometime this year. The first one is The Unlikely Prince. It's the same genre as C.S. Lewis's Chronicle of Narnia, written for 10 to 15-year-olds. Great story. Powerful, important gospel presentation, just beneath the surface. Um, very Hebrews in its in a sense. The king is sending the prince out on a quest. You can you can see what we've been talking about, right? With this suffering and purposeful suffering, and uh, it'll be great for ten to fifteen year olds. Yeah. Um, then I have a series of books, Dance Daughters of the Most High, about overlooked and underappreciated women in the Old Testament. It's it's a great read. Great for women's Bible studies, men's Bible studies, book clubs. These are heroines of our faith, and we should know more about them. We, we need to hear their voice. Send me a note, bill at gospel-app.com, to find out more about either book. If you've benefited from this YouTube show, subscribe. It helps us out more than you know. Thanks ahead of time. You can also follow me on Instagram, gospel app, one word. We'll see you next time. Take heart, child of God. 